Good evening and welcome to Nox Mente. Tonight's guest is Randy Moggins, the co-host and site owner of Off Planet Media, Off Planet, and Off Planet Radio. Do you still have Off Planet TV too? Off Planet TV. It's muted. I gotcha. Anyway, Randy, welcome to the show. You're still muted. Nish, can you hear him? Am I not hear anybody? Can I screw my shit up? Speaking of one there of my go. closest friends through my life, and her name was Tammy Soper, and she was a true bohemian in every sense of the word. Hey, and Nish, I'm, we missed the first part of that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, hello, before we get started tonight. <laughs> I love Knox um, I want to I want to acknowledge one of my lifelong closest friends that has moved, pushed through the barrier and um, and passed on, I guess, as some people call it last night in the night. And um, I just say a couple words. Her name was Tammy Soper. She was born in Poughkeepsie, New York, and she was an intense, incredible, fierce woman that um, changed my life in more ways than I'll ever be able to to illustrate. And um, I dreamt of her last night, which is also uh, part of what we talk about here. And she came through in a series of very strange symbols that. Uh, tied into my grandmother and uh, she knew my grandmother and she knew my mother um, and, and so in the dream it was my grandmother's old Lincoln silver with like a burgundy interior and my friend one of my friends was driving and all the doors were open and I passed it on the highway and I somehow my friend Jason got eye contact with me and I was able to get him to pull over and. Um, and and then this, he said, there's cockroaches coming out everywhere and creepy collies. And in the process of me looking in the doors that were open, um, Tammy's, these images of Tammy started to come through. And it was very strange that they came through with the, the, the bugs coming out of my grandmother's car. Very strange. And then I, I, I got up and I was told the news. Um, so I'm just, I'm sending out love to her three very young daughters, Sage, who is I think 22, Ginger, who I was there for midwifing in her house. She had the last two in her house, old school with midwives that have to do it on the fly because it's illegal in the United States to have a baby in your house without an actual um, allopathic person around. And so Tammy was that kind of bohemian. She did it underground the midwife network that exists and is alive came out and and birthed her babies um and so ginger was the second one i think she's probably a young teen now and violet her last one which is a very young one with autism uh, my heart goes out and so one of the things i thought would be pertinent in this discussion of nox Minte is the last time I spoke with Tammy on the phone, she was she was a very strong woman. She went to Nicaragua in the 80s, and um, she sought out psychotropics and lived a shamanic journey, pushed through all that kind of stuff. She was a coven sister and deeply um, into questioning this reality. And so it's... Um, the last conversation I had with her before this last surgery was she was a mess i could hardly understand her which is unlike her and she was the attachments why she was having a hard time with everything was her children she didn't want to leave her babies and i think everyone can understand that and um and so the part of the brain i guess that, that was affected and taken out removed the part of her memory that is about your current life and 
And that's, I think, how the universe lined up the process for her, her to let go because she just remembered the past. So us from the past, me and other friends and all that, and um, was able to, to pass in the night, which is, you know, more of the synchronistic universe. So I'm sending out love to, to Eric, Sage, Ginger, and Violet. And I thank everyone for listening to that little bit. And I think that um, we talk about death and altered states of consciousness. This is a a good place to um, speak of it. And I know Randy has a lot to say in this regard about um, these things. So with that said, hello, Randy. It's a great pleasure to have you on. Hey, it's good to be on. Good to talk with you guys. It's good to be on Nox Mente. So, so, um, yes, I've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> and I had a, a great time with Emily sitting in with, for you or, or, you know, last, what was it, last week? It's in the can, yeah. as you guys say. Right here, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, to, we tore it up, Randy. <laughs> yep, you did. I'll bet you did. <laughs> tore it up from the flow up. <laughs> Emily just makes it so easy. Yes. She does that. It's because she doesn't so, stop talking. Well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. She just pushes, she I gets know, the pertinent great. questions and she like digs it all up and pushes it out for you to see Her it. Her energy will push you <laughs> right to the wall. <laughs> I know. Yes. Yes. She, she is a powerful person. She is a powerful person. Um, I love her dearly because I know she'll hear this. Yes. <laughs> Well, I actually, she, just a note on Emily, I feel like she's a long lost sister. Like I, mm -hmm. you know, it was so immediate yeah. with her, this connection we have. I'm grateful. Yeah, we, I think we all share bonds like that. I share that with Emily. And yeah. I know she's mentioned that with you as well. And, you know, it's interesting how we all intersect with each other, even though we're um, in distant places from each other. Somehow or another, we've had the ability to make connections that I think will actually pull this whole dream network together in interesting kind of ways. Isn't that what we're doing, Randy? We're like kind of trying to be beacons, I guess, yeah, standing yeah. out here in the dark with our light. Yeah. Yeah, this is this the medium that we're using right now. I look at it as temporary, but in our imaginations a long time ago we connected and we're using hardware and software to now do what we temporarily can't remember how to do in the world that we really come from mm -hmm. i think um i think well let's just let's get started with your your early life like um Let's push back into the your earliest memories of this life and the stuff that actually sticks out. So I I want to stay in the early period. Okay. So and this includes Randy. This can be anything pop culture. It can be a tree you loved, things that your family was doing. Um, you know, TV shows, a song, dreams, anything that actually is still there for you. Yeah, a lot of that, um, well, since we're on dreams, and dreams are actually a signifier of my space here anyway. Um, I talked about this, but not for years. I, I, I did an interview years ago about my experiences with UFOs and what we call extraterrestrials, where I described the dreams I had recurrently from age three which were flying dreams. They were literally dreams where I flew or where I went through solid matter and wound up, oddly enough, never on a ship, never felt like an abduction. I communicated with beings, entities, that I understood to be actually probably my relatives um, in another dimension and various aspects of my own self. And those, in those dreams, I distinctly remember. It's, it's really funny how we transpose on the reality. I have very distinctive memories of this bedroom that I occupied when I was three to four years old, because at that time I didn't have any siblings. I was the oldest child. And I can see the room. I can see the lights. I can see the nightlight. I can see the book laying 
face down on the bed, and the book is Peter Pan, which my mother used to read to me. And it's a real touchstone for me because Peter Pan obviously features this whole concept of the the other being, the the you call it the extraterrestrial, whatever Peter Pan represents to you, it's an archetype that comes and takes the children. And that's a lot of what this was. It was the sense of being lifted out astrally, I guess, out of my body, being able to pass through walls and being able to fly. And those dreams are very real to me. Um, they're touchstones because I think what was burned into me at that point at three years old was my understanding that the physicality we occupy is one slice of a much bigger dimensional array that we occupy. So it is very meaningful to me in, in, in the sense that, you know, I put it in the context of UFOs, I put it in the con context of extraterrestrials because those are the mythologies that we current, currently live in. But the, the, classic retail, the classic tale of Peter Pan is, in fact, very accurate and relative to my sense of what this adventure is, of how magical beings come into our existence and they take us places. And in our night travels, we're able to transcend the Earth realm and we're able to navigate spaces that we otherwise can't navigate in ways that we physically can't right now. That's, um, I think this is a very important uh, idea to get across to, is that the aliens and ETs are really, it's just the current, it's just the current um, mask or suit that this, yeah. these archetypes are wearing. The and other, so, the other. yes. And so it, it's, people get hung up on it, which is interesting um, because we've had, we've had the others, we've had those archetypes for as long, I, I, you know, I speculate as long as we've. Since we first dreamed them up. <laughs> yeah, as long as this dream's yeah. been going on way far away in the void. <laughs> well, even the father of archetypes himself, C.G. Jung, was very interested in the UFO phenomenology in the later years of his life. Largely yes. because I think he recognized that this was a modern archetype, that this was something that had come in, you know, living in that period especially after 1947, and what Roswell represented in terms of, I will say, the first crack in the veil, mm -hmm. and the fact that Jung occupied the epoch right before that, but he was actually predefining it in his work. Oh, yeah, you, definitely. You know, if you look at the work of Jung, they've only in recent years released the Red Book, which was his most mystical work, the family never wanted it released because they thought it made him look insane. You read the book and you suddenly realize this guy was tripping before LSD. Oh, yeah. He he's only, a wizard. <laughs> yeah, he had a wizard. He had a window open into the consciousness of the present age. It was very important for Jung to maintain a sense of credibility in the yes. scientific community. And so he kept those things very private. And then, and then the family did, and the friends. But now we are so fortunate that these people are all dying off, and this information's coming forth. Um, on top but he of that, did, yeah, he did have quite sorry. a bit to say. On top of all that, uh, no I care, think Jerry. The um, this was probably the first time in this generation, this cycle, rather, that uh, the. The other has been harnessed as a disinformation tool too, and used against yeah. the people, and that is unique about this time. Well, there's that. That's the whole shadow idea of it, you know. That this the interplay. It's the collective shadow that right. is at I get, play. I get that, but I'm saying like for the government to yeah. Put out Roswell, right? The whole Roswell thing that incited this virus to make us afraid of this thing even more mm -hmm. than we should be. When people need to deal with it, that's why it's coming at them, right? It's being spun as it's from outer space, it's an alien, whatever. I mean, I think that's even extra harmful on top. That, you know, it's PTSD on top of PTSD. Mm, it was weaponized. Yeah. And thank you. Perfect word. It was a cover 
for other things that were going on in the background in terms of cheese pizza what happened. <laughs> I mean, 1947, look what happened that year. That is the year of fuckery <laughs> in my mind. Everything it happened. So much. Everything it's the happened. complete beginning of the age of modern fuckery. And it was locked <laughs> in by the, the by the super blood moon in January of 1948. That locked in that reality. All the spells they cast yeah. that year. Isn't it interesting that we're now coming up on a blood moon in July after the eclipse last year? which was, uh, I'm probably taking this show way off of its normal format. No, because no, I, we, I this wanted is, to actually talk not. about that, too. <laughs> you, you are not. We're, 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 we've been in this succession of eclipses and blood moons now for, gosh, I guess about four years. And people are noticing it, but they're noticing the effects. and They're not looking behind the veil at what all this means. Um, I, I have had the sense, and I, I've said this on the shows and I've written about it, the eclipse last summer was monumental in what occurred. Because for the first time since that blood moon in 1948 that you just talked about, Jerry, I think there is an open window now for us to take back some of the narrative that has been spun for us over the last 70 years. And I think that's what the consciousness wave is that we're living in. It's why there's a core group of people who are aware, who are awake, and have um, the ability to summon the power to turn the narrative away from the fear and away from the doom and gloom destruction narratives that have been woven, quite frankly, going back into biblical times. A lot of that's been used mm -hmm. against us. These, all these narratives of death and destruction, which because we live in a culture now where language has been <clears throat> mercilessly destroyed, and we have no ability to con conceptualize beyond literal linear thinking, um, my experience has been that most of the, the apocalyptic narratives have been the victim of a very malignant translation and interpretation over many ages, and that's been used against us. When you read the ancient texts, what you come to understand is that there's a duality in the manuscripts themselves. This is not a literal apocalypse or a literal end of the world. It is an end of the world in terms of this age which has been ruled by fear and by a very shallow sense of our own beingness, our ability to enter into the gateways of higher consciousness in the universe itself. And so the war right now isn't a war of information, it's a war of consciousness. It's a war of elevating the consciousness of people to the point where they realize that they no longer have to take a preformed narrative of gloom, doom, death, and destruction, but they can weave their own destiny out of the current material. It's it's literally making the unconscious conscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and in, in, you know, to make it as simplistic as possible, which is exactly what you was talking about. See, what's beautiful about what you related at the beginning of the show about the passing of your friend, and you know, when somebody passes over, they leave people behind, and we're all attached. To people in very emotional ways that are meaningful to us and there's a sadness to that but um i've never been particularly moved to grief over death generally and having gone through the loss of both of my parents now or over the last well this you know last seven years i discovered that there is a connection and a bond with people who are meaningful to us because we live in a world where there's an endless procession of people. We're not all connected together. We're connected to people that I think are part of an eternal soul group. So your friend's passing in one sense because you picked up in dream state on it with that marvelous symbology of the Lincoln and the bugs and there's so much there that, 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 that quite frankly, um, Jung would have a field day with the imagery in that. But 
it isn't morbid, it celebrates life and it celebrates our intuitive linkages with people that are part of our experience here and how those connections don't stop. They basically continue in the other realms. Yeah, and you know, when I was analyzing the dream, before I found out that she had moved on through, I thought, what a strange, you know, I've never dreamt of cockroaches before. And then coming out of my grandmother's car, just the fact that that car showed up, I, I thought that here's the line that came into my head. And I cannot remember, but one of you may, um, man, I think it's Oppenheimer, but I could be wrong, um, that that the only thing that will live in the face of like annihilation will be cockroaches, right? Mm -hmm. That, that I don't know exactly what that phrase is, but the, the point there and the symbol of it is that they go on, they continue to live. And, and in the dream, they weren't, they weren't creepy and gross. I don't have a negative association with them. So I've never really had to deal with them. Um, so I just think of them as industrious and that lines never left my head. So it was like a clear idea from Tammy, like I'm still here. And, and not only that, this, she reminded me of my grandmother, hence the grandmother's car, but all the doors are open. She's, yeah. she's left. Yeah. <laughs> it's so great. I, she's left, but she's still here. And so, and then the dream went on and all this other personal stuff I'd rather not put out there, but, I have always felt that we continue our relationships and with all the many deaths I've been through, that's been my experience is these, they continue and we on somehow in a conscious way, close ourselves off. And, um, like one of the things that I thought was death must have come like a friend to her rather than cloaked in darkness as a grim reaper, right? Like this is how I think it came like a wonderful birth not only that just the imagery there of the passenger in the car and the, 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 the symbolic it speaks to an image of a vehicle yes. that we are yes absolutely you know, we're, we're in a culture that is absolutely narcissistically in love with the physical form um completely enamored of the human body and what is required to sustain it of beauty beauty externality 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 um superficial values and how we base our existence on what we see with our physical eyes and yet every evidence around us indicates that all of this passes and fades the most beautiful among us will wind up at the end of their life should it be so willed to live that long as bent over wrinkled gray people because that's that's the arc of of our lives naturally um some people live shorter lives are spared of that what was it the great career move uh, die young and have a great looking corpse yeah yeah said. but that's that. not really even the goal either the goal is to fulfill the mission that you came in to do in this world to discover it to glean it to perfect it and a lot of it is just the perfection of self. It's the perfection of the consciousness, the soul being that is in this vessel, in this vehicle. So in a lot of ways, what you saw with the bug scurrying out of that, 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 that Lincoln was the vehicle being vacated by the creatures who, let's just say, are sort of the harbingers of the lower forms of life. Mm -hmm. and that that's, that's left the room, you know, and that... There's the vehicle and it's empty now, and um, soul, the spirit, the real being has passed over into the other realms. Absolutely. The, the next image in that dream, and that's, this is the only one I'll, I'll share beyond this, is I, um, I looked out, it was like Arizona, you know, it was desert, high mountain desert, mm -hmm. and I looked out and the winds so the whole thing, the winds just gust over the pinon trees. And it was, it was absolutely breathtaking. I sat there and I thought, this is like a scene from Dr. Zhivago, you know, like wide angle lens, gigantic, yeah. huge feeling. The wind is the spirit, right? And um, 
and as as Jung came to see in in his later work in private conversations, but it's in the Red Book, um, that the elements, are just like the celestial bodies, they're spirits. Mm-hmm. That this, they're actually external <laughs> mm-hmm. and not internal. And so, uh, um, uh, yeah, I had a sense of grandness there, a sense of larger than even though this is a dreamscape larger than that it was it was beautiful it, it had me um it was one of those dreams where i took pause now I, I can't say it was particularly lucid it was just all pretty standard dream fare so i wasn't um i wasn't pushing into it enough or any whatever um but that that was there yeah but it stayed with you it was it's what I call a palpable dream. I've had them where I wake up. I've had dreams where I woke up and for an, an entire day, there are ghosts of a dream following me. I can't shake them. There's yes. Some, some kind of emotional connection that was so real in that dream that it has triggered emotional responses and depths that I don't experience all that often. And it's yeah. there, but I've had maybe three or four of them over the last 20 years. The last one I had a couple of years ago. And I remember waking up in the morning and you literally, it's literally a haunting. You feel like you've been somewhere. You have a, a emotional range that's extended beyond our normal flat response. Even just the sense of profound sorrow profound joy profound love that you feel that you you know it, it will stay with you for an entire day that's that to me is, is is such a powerful expression of dream state that i can't help but think i didn't just see that i didn't just dream it i was there i yes. experienced this and that i'm engaging senses that i don't normally this this came to awaken something in me and that sense that you want to hold it you just want to you want to hold that vision you want to hold those emotions because we can't hold on and we can't hold on to them for long because they're too intense yes and it's that's the beauty of that type of dream is that when it comes it's there to teach you something usually what i do is i keep journals i have notebooks all over the place and I'm not real disciplined about dream journaling. I did this years and years ago. But when I have one of these, I try to capture the imagery. And usually what I do is I try to capture it poetically. Because that's mm. the most meaningful language for me. Yes. The language of dreams is actually the, the language of verse. Yes, I agree. So a lot of the poetry and a lot of the writing I do is in, in, in verse, and a lot of it comes from dream state. It's um, f- for me. I I write poetically too, and for me, it's the, is the language of dreams. His poetry to me is painting pictures, and and that's what that's symbols. Mm-hmm. And dream the dream language is is completely a symbolic language, and, and this this actually harkens back to one of the things I wanted to get at was what was your relationship with nature when you were very young. Yeah, I grew up around. I mean, I, my earliest life was actually in a housing track. Um, my father was in the Korean War. And after the Korean War, the GI Bill, they built a bunch of houses. They would just, you know, they'd buy up land and they'd put track houses in. However, the track neighborhood that I lived in was at the foot of the Appalachian Mountains, where I still live here, and not actually all that far from where I actually was when I was small. So I had a sense of nature. But on top of that, I spent a lot of my summers on my grandparents farm, which was over 400 acres. And it was there that I really started to tap into nature. Uh, when I was finally able to get around by my, I had mystical experiences on that farm. I saw more UFOs come across the mountains on that farm than I can 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 recount. And encounters Ooh. with them. Of, Will you give you know, us a couple examples of the the real like the most bizarre ones? 
uh, yeah, the most memorable one was probably when I was mm, five, five years old. And I was spending, I used to go, go for two weeks at a time and spend on the farm with my, with my grandparents. And one night after dinner, my grandparents were old school farmers. So they had, they got up at five in the morning. They had a very strict, their big meal was lunch. Dinner was usually a smaller meal, a cold meal, and that would be around 5 p.m. And then after that, I went out into the farm wandering. And I must have walked around for a couple hours. It was still daylight. It was evening. And I went up on a hill where, in a meadow where there's a cow pasture. I wasn't supposed to go there because theoretically there are bulls out there and you really don't want to be in an open pasture where there were bulls. But I was a five-year-old boy, so I didn't really pay heed to that. Went up on top of this hill and sat on the hill looking to the south west where the range of mountains called the blue mountains which are part of the appalachians here run in a east west pattern and these particular mountains are where they placed um tv antennas things like that because they overlook an entire river valley and so i sat there i was watching just watching nature and walking around and a light caught my eye <clears throat> coming across the mountain on a, on a trajectory headed sort of northeast but paralleling the mountain range itself i saw this light come in and it came in over a distance of probably about 15 miles based on my reckoning of it now because i now are able to reckon mileage it seemed like a long distance but what happened was that thing came down and eventually, somehow or another, it got very large in the sky. It got very brilliant. I remember sensing something like what you feel in a static field where the hair on your arm stands up and you get goosebumps and you have this sense of being in an electrical field. And I smelled something. But to this day, I've never been able to duplicate it, but in my more adult sense, I would refer to it sort of as uh, the smell of burning ozone. That's the only thing I can, I can compare it to, burning ozone. If you know what ozone smells like. I do. Ed, Ed, <laughs> I dream Ed about that smell. And a kind of burnt odor to that. And what I remember was it flashed there was colors and the next thing i know i'm walking down this hill and it is dark and i'm like i'm like in a world of trouble they're all out looking for me my uncles my grandparents my grandparents were disciplinarians but not harsh uh, i got my butt dusted that night with the broom and I apologized and cried profusely and said, I'm sorry, I was walking, I got lost, I didn't know what time it was. I was gone for, <laughs> it's gone for probably about three and a half hours. I have no idea where I was. Oh, wow. Yeah, missing time. Classic. Did you tell them what happened? No, I just that... said I got lost. There was <laughs> oh, no explanation for this. How do you, how do you, how does a five-year-old even conceptualize that? We, yeah. You know, kids don't really have, even at five, and I know this because I've raised kids, and specifically boys. They have no sense of time at all. They don't know. They don't care. You know, they, they go off and they do what they're doing. And most people understand that. Even if you're a parent and your kid's out late and you're worried about them, and you're grateful they come back, you understand <clears throat> on a basic level that they don't really have a good sense of time. And I don't even have a good sense of time as an adult. So, you know, add to that. So, no, I never bothered to explain much of anything. I felt then haunted for days. Like, what happened? Oh, and yeah, of course. Some of that would creep into dreams over the years of what happened, of what that was, what that represented. And Would you share some of those dreams that that actually creeped into? Yeah, just the, the beings that I came to know, whether you call them 
ETs, all those machines or whatever they are, UFOs, those are just terms. I, from the age of three, going back to the flying dreams, was very aware that I was connected to a group of people who did not live inside of this construct, but were in some way guides, guardians, um, some type of like almost celestial family. And I had contacts with them. I, if I had my notes and I don't have them in front of me, I could give you the names of two of the beings that I met several times. And one of the narratives in UFO abduction stories is people will talk about classrooms where they're basically taken into a place and they have the sense that they are being trained. And that's kind of the sense that I had. I didn't really have the classroom experience. I do remember seeing other humans in some of my travels. And in fact, humans that I suspect I've encountered later on in, quote, real life. But the sense that I got was that I was being trained, that I was being imparted with knowledge on some level, which I think a lot of it was preparing me to just live in the age that we're in now and to do... <clears throat> I think a lot of it is what's bled out of my shows over the last 10 years. I think a lot of it just bleeds out. I don't think there's a conscious stream where I can sit down and say, this is what I was told, this is what I've shown. I love people that can do that. I can't do that. But I know things because I know them, and I intuit things, and I have the sense that I'm here to do something and I just have to go through all these steps, whatever it is. I mean, doing radio shows, writing, going out and meeting people. Most of my life is kind of conducted around seemingly mon mundane things that wind up with very interesting side journeys. So my sense is that, yes, those beings were, you can refer to them as angels, the fae, um, I don't know. I mean, I have names for two of them. And other than that, other than to say that they were rather tall, they were light complected. I won't call them tall blondes, but that would be a good analogy. They were, they were beings that came into my life and took me into their world to prepare me for something I was supposed to do. Very interesting. I, um, yeah, I could hone in on some of that, but I, I don't want to. I try not to make oh, this. Oh, please, we could do. I'd love to. I'd love to hear you <laughs> hone in on that. Well, I I wanted to say, and, and it actually relates to a dream. When my cousin died, I think I was like twenty. He was twenty one. Um, I had the dream again the night before, and in the dream, he. This was more straightforward, like um, straightforward imagery. Now remember, I, you don't know this. I wasn't raised in a, a Christian household at all, so those aren't my symbols. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, there was a, a cage, this cage, and this light being was in it that kind of looked angelic. You know, like when later on when I'd observe more Christianized art, you know, you'd see those images of the shining ones, and and so it lifted up out of the ground, and then the cage opened up, and this being went away. And, um, and then I woke up, I actually was woken up by a phone call from my momo saying that you're, John you're had passed. Woke, all right. <laughs> and so, but here's, so here's the dream that, that happened after that. So he, he came to, we were very close. This was the only cousin, this only person in my family that I, that was not like my mother or my grandmother that I was very close with, very, very close. He came to me and he was in a school. And we were in, he had me in the hall. I couldn't be in the classrooms, but it was on a ship and he had a backpack and he taught. And so, I mean, I'm just assuming Randy, this was a dream. It didn't, it has all the characteristics of it, but there was, there was a lot going on at this particular time, but he, he started talking about these things 
he 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 actually is the first person that put this alternate dimension idea into my head through that communication mm. in the hallway of a school where he had a backpack and was being taught was was like taking on a mission you know yeah. being taught what what was next and um and so you're recounting that and telling me that and and there were very interesting characters walking around as well i'd have to consult my journal to give you any hard details it's been a very long time ago yeah. um but that you're you're retelling that made me remember that particular imagery of this kind of school and um that that what he was telling me it was very strange it's it's never left me but it's it's very um i can see i can see that going into the mold of other things like program or um or abduction stuff where he was the guide or his image was at least so I don't know. It, it's just, it's weird that that came up. It's weird that you brought that up, and that I think about this from thirty years ago. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these places that we go are, are just as real as the places as we occupy right now, even if it's in dream state. I, I I have a very strong sense, not only of occupying other worlds, but of actually building other worlds. That's an interesting concept as well. I've had had numerous dreams where I had the sense that I was the architect of a world, a, a world building, realm building, where somehow or another we are creating out of the material here. This mm -hmm. is primitive material. It's molecular. It's carbon-based. It's very physical. But this is the playground that we have to practice what becomes a more expanded version of it when, I guess you call it the other side, in terms of world building, um, realm construction. Uh, I just sense, sense that there's always a creative urge. It's an impulse that universe has that is breathed into us and that when we discover who we are, and why we're here, we can begin to use this world to accumulate tools, much like training, just, just, like, just like you would sit down with a flight simulator and use the flight simulator mm -hmm. before you ever actually navigate a real aircraft. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we're in a simulator, which is kind of ac accurate when you look at the, the, the matrix slash construct theories that have been you know, very popular for, well, since the late 90s, but on the internet, this has become a recurrent theme within uh, the circles that we all are in, of people who have the sense that this is some kind of training, some kind of simulation, and that we have the sense that we've experienced other realms, either in dream state or in those moments of liminality where we occupy where we're walking between worlds what do you think about so so i have long i'm sure you everyone's noticed this you you notice mountains that look like mm -hmm. gods or you know people and dragons and then yeah. i just recently have been seeing this hitting the rounds what do you think about the density of of spirit and matter like that you know, that's interesting. I just had a conversation with somebody yesterday about that almost exact subject, about all of these formations. It came out of a conversation that I had where I, where I talked about um, when I was a kid, I used to spend a lot of time in a quarry near where I grew up. There was an old stone quarry, and it was limestone quite predominantly. And also, there was a lot of deposits of quartz. But we were going to this, we were going to the canyons in this quarry. And I always had the sense that the rocks themselves were a frequency, that there was a vibration there, and that there was, there was something vibrant about it. We look at what, things like rocks and dirt, and we think of it as inanimate. My understanding 
of solid matter is very different because I think at any given moment, what we view as something that's solid is much like the concept of glass, which most people know glass is not a solid. It's just an extremely super cool, slow, slowing liquid. And so our sense of time being what it is, we view things in a petrified state that in fact, we're only getting snapshots to something that has a longer time range than we do. This is really complicated. So I love it though. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Jerry so, does too. So we're viewing something that's frozen and petrified, but in fact, that particular entity is an animation on a very different time frame. So we're getting a snapshot of something that's actually, you know, 32 pr frames per second or something because of our inability to to reckon time the way that thing exists in its own native dimension. So we have all these like petroglyphic things that look like stuff. I mean, uh, the sphinx type rock formations and dragons and things like that. Um, many people have the sense that these mountains <clears throat> are remnants of petrified trees. I mean, that's going around for a couple of years on the internet. It's a yeah. fascinating theory, and it's, a, it's, it's if nothing else, it's a mind exercise. There's a guy, uh, Mr. MBB333, are you familiar with him? No? Nope. Okay. Nope. He's got a video out about that. He's found what he claims are branches and leaves from that tree next to one of those mesas. Uh, oh, that is a good one, Jer. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what to think about it, too. I agree. Well, I think it's a fascinating theory, mm -hmm. and it begs the question, <clears throat> the age of this realm that we live in, we call Earth, doesn't really, where the hell are the trees at? I mean, you look at, I, I, and I live in a neighborhood here. This is an old neighborhood. I have trees around me. Some of them are, you know, 60 years old. And some of these trees around here run 70, 80 feet high, including the pines that sit on the west side of my property here. These trees are huge by our estimation. I mean, they tower over the houses here. So you take 60 years and extrapolate it out to 600 years or 6,000 years, the life of trees, and, and, and tell me where the very large trees would be that existed over the course of millennia, forget millions of years, I'll, I'll take 2,000, and show me the trees that should have existed because you wouldn't be chopping them down because you couldn't, and they would still exist, at least a remnant of them. It doesn't make sense. It, they've transformed into something, or the earth has been terraformed in such a way that what we call trees now, now may not even be the same thing that they were then, or they have petrified themselves into what we now call mountains. Just, just a thought. I mean, I get the sense that there's a sense of antiquity of things and rocks that it really speaks to me energetically. And the fact that we see these formations and we see these forms in petrified form seems to indicate that hmm, either something exists there in a state we don't quite discern. We call it mineral because that's what we know it to be. Mm -hmm. But there's an energetic to it. We know that. We know that about crystals. We know what we can do with a simple quartz crystal and how we can conduct energy through it and how on a sophisticated level, technology has harvested that same material in very fundamental ways, including computer technology. Do you think there is a, and I want to, I want to extend this to the idea of dreaming, although I think we are dreaming now, um, but do you think there's the sentience with the natural world? So trees, the ocean, you know, the bigger, the bigger archetypes as Jung would call them. Oh yeah, absolutely. Everything has an energetic footprint. Mm -hmm. Everything's living. Yes. We're living, we're living on a living being <laughs> that is itself encompassing an entire ecosystem beyond what I think we completely discern. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, the frequencies of things that we consider to be inanimate objects, a piece of wood, a rock, this is alluded to in the Gnostic writings. You know, if you go and you look at the words of Jesus in the Gnostic writings, he talks about this, about the, you know, pick up a rock, look at a piece of wood. That's where I'm found. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, fundamentally, we have become very callous as human beings about our natural surroundings because we've turned them into unnatural surroundings. The native people know this. They, you know, even the remnant of them now know this. They know that there's a sacredness to the formation of the natural world that's been violated. There's violence that's been done against it and against its spirit. And so from my standpoint, my understanding is that with as much reverence as possible, we have to go into nature and commune with it and begin to discern its energies and to commune with it, understanding that not only is it living, but it has a spirit, a spirit that's individuated and also part of a grand super spirit. See, everything's living. Yes, I agree. Do you, when you're dreaming, do you ex experience nature? I mean, so when you come back from the experience, do, does nature stand out or do you have interactions with what you consider the natural world within the dream, within a dream? In certain times, types of dreams I have, they take place in a natural surrounding. I, I'd say the best of them do. Where you trend over into the nightmare world is when you're, you're suddenly dealing with symmetrical forms. I mean, almost every... So the difference in dreams and nightmares and I will say certain types of terror are that where we encounter the dark aspects of ourselves in terms of even our experiences. When I encounter a cubic form or a box in a dream, that generally comes off to me as a warning or a sense of apprehension about it because it's symmetrical. And if I'm inside of it or if I enter it, um, I then get the imagery of captivity. Whereas in dream state, when I'm outside of these forms, where I'm in expanse, where I'm in a natural place. A natural place would include water, vegetation, rocks, and animal life, <clears throat> including animal spirits, as well as the etheric spirits. You know, going into um, where I talk about the Fae and we talk about um, the like sprites and beings that live in water, sylphs. Uh, I can remember as a kid, there was, a, there was a stream that ran on my grandparents' farm down off of a mountain stream into a place that was a hollow where we used to have picnics. And I can remember going out there when I was a kid with my cousins, and sometimes I would go up high on the sill, and I would sit by the stream that came down. And when you sat there and you got very still, you could begin to commune with the beings that came out of the water that were um, these, what do you call them, primitives? Um, much like what people would attribute to um, pixies and fairies and things like that. Elementals. Elementals, that's the word I was looking for, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the elementals. And see, the those, those things still, they don't exist the way they did then because this was still unspoiled land. This was land that had been handed down for a couple hundred years to the family. So it wasn't despoiled the way it is now. And more people believed in them. Exactly. And we learned this yeah. lesson from yeah. American gods. Yeah. yeah. Do you encounter in, so what are your encounters with, I have two questions here within, the, within dreaming your encounters with and maybe a couple examples with animals and then also large bodies of water as far as deep water more so than ponds and oh, streams you're going, 
You're going for the big one, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> of course. This is going. Yeah, so animals are interesting because they're totems. They they represent aspects uh, variously. Um, animals tend to be highly symbolic. Owls are pretty creepy. They show up a lot. Um, wolves. Have you ever talked to uh, Mike Cleland? About his all stuff? I know Mike Clellan. I've actually had very long conversations with Mike Clellan for years. Okay. Before he ever wrote that book. Mike Clellan called me in 2005. He was really freaked out at the time. I mean, he had dad just had some pretty strange encounters, and Mike was freaked out. And he had heard me talking about some of my UFO experiences, and we sat down and kind of shared experiences and stuff. And he was just then starting to kind of develop the the thing with the owls, you know, of what what was really going on with that because he was he was going out and camping in crazy places, mm -hmm. you know, which he does. That's right. what he does. Right. He's probably like like one of the purest people out there in terms of filtering. I will say the supernatural slash black ops side of things into a natural format. Mm -hmm. So it's real interesting. But I mean, you know. I didn't mean to derail you what you were saying. I'm sorry. No, just no, no. Totally I mean, and if Mike hears this, hey, shout out, bro. I've, Definitely. I've, he needs to come on now because we've mentioned him. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and plus this was all gold. He'll show up. So, yeah, they show up. And generally, um, I interpret freely. My totem tends to be the bear and has been for a long time. The bear is very significant to me in terms of what it represents, in terms of strength, agility, speed. The fact that the bear specifically, but almost any animal that has a hibernation cycle, is something we need to look at because there's something deeper there about the hibernation cycle and what that represents, of being able to extend life by shutting down and going into a deep state where the body itself goes into the cellular rest period. That's, that's spoken to me a lot over the years. When I see a bear, one of the th messages it conveys to me is that I need to slow down. I need to take time. I need to shut down. I need to hibernate, which may mean that over a weekend, I detach from the normal busyness and I go meditate someplace. I go into nature. I go into a place of rest. So that's an example of animals that will appear to me in dream state that I think are harbingers of a message that my oversoul, higher self, however you want to view that, is trying to communicate. Excellent. I agree on the hibernation thing. I think that that is sorely um, underappreciated and talked about. Yeah, I did a podcast years ago. I should probably repost it sometime. It's called The Season of the Bear, which went into how I interpreted that. It's probably still on one of my websites somewhere. Uh, but it, that, that's a meaningful one. Um, like I said, owls show up, they're kind of creepy. Um, Why are the owls creepy in your experience? I think the owls have played into the ET experience a lot just because they're creatures of the night. Mm -hmm. They tend to be vigilant. They also have forms that in shadow tend to be very close to the gray aliens. Mm -hmm. And you know, even Dolores Cannon herself reported of apparitions of owls as she was traveling in and out of her property a number of times. And yeah. that's what Mike, Mike Clellan was talking about in his work, was the sense that it, whether you consider it to be a harbinger whether you consider it to be a self-protective mechanism of the mind or whether this is some kind of screen memory that um, owls have a very deep identification with gray aliens and let's just say more menacing forms in the night because the owl is a predator. Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely not to be forgotten. So the big one. The water. Big bodies <laughs> of water. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> As you know, this is something Emily and I have talked about. We've talked about it on the shows. We've talked about it in small groups. And we've explored it extensively because both of us 
both of, both of us have had very similar memories, dreams, sense of water as a portal in the space. And I think the same thing. <clears throat> I think it's in the ocean. How mm-hmm. here, our, here. Backgrounds, our backgrounds seem to indicate we may have been trained. And it's something that I've started to articulate a little better. Again, it's interesting this is coming up because conversation I had with a friend yesterday feels like rehearsal for this right now. Because I said, <clears throat> my sense is that as a child, one of, one of the things I was trained for was to operate in dream realm and that the entry point for that was water because I have memories of sitting on the bottom of a pool literally sitting on the bottom of a swimming pool. I have memories of being in water and moving through portals and and passageways. I have memories of moving through the inside of the earth, through tunnels, passages, labyrinths, to gateways that took us. And this was one of these places where there were groups involved that took us to a gateway that exists right south of me here in the Chesapeake Bay that's a confluence into the, into the Atlantic Ocean. And I have very distinct memories of going through this confluence and then entering a portal that then took us to a port where we were transported into something you would call space, but it's not interstellar. It is the void. It is the expanse, um, the deep. That's actually what it's called in the scriptures in the Bible. It's called the deep, where it talks about specifically Leviathan. And I think there's a lot of symbolic cloaking that goes on in that language that masks that what's above us isn't space. What's above us is an expanse, but it's not space, but space itself is something that's accessible through a membrane, through water. And specifically, you would say oceanic, but it may in fact even be lakes and mountain streams, because mountains are portals too. I can't help but throw in here all the the mermaid Yes, Jerry, that's where I wanted to get to. data that's being thrown at us right now. In fact, and this is even crazy. This is, I've had a couple of synchros already <laughs> during the show. Um, I, listened, <laughs> I re-listened to the Chris Knowles episode on Sirens, uh, Heaven or Las Vegas. Oh, um, yeah, that's great stuff. It's yeah. a great episode. It goes into the Jeff Buckley. And, yep, yep, yeah. yep. And the whole thing with Liz Frazier. And, Call and, two twins. And, yeah. Yeah. But I've been watching, try, not binge watching, but just slowly watching the first season of this new show called Siren. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know where it's from. I'll just say that. I'll look it up, though. But it's, uh, it's about mermaids coming on land and befriending humans. <laughs> like, it's more, even more, you know, it's a whole season. Here's a whole season of the show. The mer people as the... New Jerry, reality. give a link to that in show notes and all that. I will. I w- I'm getting there. I'm just saying. I. It's just really weird. And then to like, um, I don't know. Two days ago, I don't even know when. Kristen Lang just sent me all this stuff on the Mer- Merovian. Merovingians, ass- yeah. Yeah, yep. Merovingians. Yep. Thank you. Which is which kept me fascinated into, um into the wee hours before I slept well, last Kristen night. Kristen Lang is the friend I was talking to yesterday, so. I and love her. Much love to Kristen just, if just, you're out yeah, there. much love out there. Because that was actually, I guess, the dress rehearsal for today. That was actually on our um, private Facebook group where this was coming out about the Merovingians and the word mer- mer is there. Yeah, I'm and, fascinated by this. You know, I mean, all these water images, even... The concept that we're in the age of Aquarius now, that the previous age was the Pisces and the Piscean age. And if you take the mythology of the Jesus figure and the walking on water and the passing through water and the concepts that birth is passing, passing through water, you, 
passing through a water membrane, you're passing through the womb, the matrix. You know, again, the veil. The veil. The dimensional aspects of this, even our bodies, convey the sense that we are portals, we are gateways. On a physical level, as well as on a, a mental, spiritual, and consciousness level. I, I found um, one of the things I found in this that was extremely significant for me personally, um, and I have a deep, deep tie to to the water stuff, I think, as a lot of us do, um, was the tie in of the bees. Mm. That's all my whole entire life. There's been something about the bees and I attract them. I've never been afraid of them. People, they, they come on walks when I'm walking with people, they come around and um, and then to learn just, I haven't dug in enough, but I started to get into some of that imagery around all this, which seems counterintuitive in a way, like the, you think the water and the, I don't know, somehow I, was, I wasn't putting it together and now it seems to be seamlessly fitting. That's interesting. Yeah, it's in, the, it's in some of the stuff that Kristen sent me. Um, that there's just a lot I want to dig into, but I wanted to put that out. Like I just got the image of the bee over the crown as we were talking. That is part of part of a blood. Well, the bees, are, you know, that's a very persistent symbol too. That you know, some people that's one of their totems is the bee. I mean, the Masonic orders use it as a metaphor for the work. The great work. Yes, yes. It kind of epitomizes the cellular aspect. Yes. The high all that, itself, all of all, that. Yeah, all that I'm, I'm aware of. And they even have it. It's heavy in this season of, of Legion, that it's mm -hmm. beehive everywhere. But I had never put it together with like the Mer stuff. And so it was, it, it's um, the stuff that, the stuff I was reading just was blowing my mind with this connection to the MERS stuff. And I, granted, I'm not educated enough in this to speak intelligently. So I just throwing that out to see what, what your connections were with that. Yeah, no, I don't really have a grasp right now on the connection between the bees and the water stuff. Uh, I probably need to talk to Kristen and get her to send me that some of that some of that's probably gone by me because I'm so distant right now engaging in social media. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the water imagery is persistent. It's been there. It, it's, um, you know, when I start talking to people who are, as Emily and I like to say, one of us, and that's yes. <laughs> pretty much anybody that we talk to, all the people that we're interacting with on the internet, um, for the most part, there's a connectedness, and that, that's a persistent image that keeps coming up, is the sense that water is a gateway. We have the sense that <laughs> we've been there, mm -hmm. that even breathing underwater isn't an impossibility, which is the sense that I have. And... I spent a tremendous amount of time in water as a kid. I mean, I was, a, I love swimming. I love diving. And I, like I said, I just have this weird memory of sitting on the bottom of a swimming pool for a really long time. I have, you said that and I, I do too, but I, in my memory, I feel like I, I put in swimming pools and I want to make that clear. I would always get in a swimming pool. Oh, I, deep water scares me, always has. I was born with webbed feet. There's something out the water wanting to pull me in. It's all my own fears, I'm sure. But I remember sitting in, in, in clear chlorinated pool water at the bottom. And I have many memories of that, but I don't have memories of going anywhere else. I just have memories of just sitting there. So for whatever that's worth. And I hadn't thought about him until you brought that up. So I'm going to have to do a little digging into my own unconscious there. You know, there's an old Twilight Zone episode. I was trying to remember the name of it. Where a child who's being verbally abused by a very narcissistic parent. This goes back 
This is probably 1964. And in this episode of The Twilight Zone, this child dives into the pool, goes down to the bottom of the pool, and comes out on the other side in another dimension. I remember that. <laughs> yes. So, the, the fear. <laughs> or uh, the, the bewitching pool, is that it? Bewitching, yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. Yes. Oh, that's, oh, man. that's the second episode. It's the, the first, first episode in that. Series, yeah. Series it is. is the fear. It's the fear in the yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's. You know, uh, and I always uh, wonder what Rod Serling. Rod Serling. <laughs> in, oh, he definitely knew. Yes. You know, you, you, we grew up in a period before the, some of the filters came on. Yeah. So a guy like Serling could come around. <clears throat> he's there with Kubrick probably as one mm -hmm. of the great revelators of our time in terms of what he actually exposited in those, those TV shows. But that particular episode, I've watched that thing a half dozen times, and every time I just go, you don't just pull ideas like that out. Right. That, that comes from <laughs> that comes from, pardon the pun, a well of the subconscious that understands something about yes. the dimensional mechanics that can occur in water. What are your so kind of what do you think about what is the nowness, Randy? This experience we're having that we consider ourselves um you know, mildly lucid, awake, and um, where we actually separate ourselves from going to bed and dreaming or or dying. What's this nowness, in your opinion? Hmm. That's really the biggest question of all, isn't it? Is it the dreamer dreaming the dream inside the dream? <laughs> if you take dream state and you work through it, you are at times able to see yourself in a dream. I don't know if you've ever experienced that or not. Where you observe yourself seeing yourself and you understand that we are participants, observers, and we're also acting on, in parallel, in tandem, with not only the oversoul, that's just my term for it. I, <clears throat> higher self's okay. I like the concept of the oversoul. But within the construct of the oversoul or the higher being, it's fractalized. We're not one being. We are expressions. We are many expressions of one being. So there are, within that construct and within our consciousness as it functions in time, and then it gets magnified once we go out of time, which is dream state. We become somewhat aware that there are beings that are expressions or what I call aspects of ourselves. In other words, those beings, those aspect selves, <clears throat> some people would like, and this Emily and I talked about this a lot, were these altars, were these maybe personalities that fractured off as a result of traumatic programming or something. And I understand that, I get that. <clears throat> but what I'm talking about isn't, it isn't a separate personality. It's a completely different expression of who we are in, in a resonance pattern. And it, this will sound insane, but okay. Bring uh, the insane on. <laughs> We I, love it. You know, I'm going into therapy f to deal with this stuff, so I'll just deal with it here too. So, like, I've always had the sense that that I have a fe female aspect, and the female aspect has a name. I know her as Audra, and it's really strange because even as a kid, I was very aware of a female self. It wasn't me, in the sense of expression. It was me, in the sense of intent and consciousness. As a shared, we were sharing vistas of separate realities that kind of bend over into each other. In other words, this, this concept that, that when the light's just right, sometimes you can almost see the glimmer of the other side 
the other aspect like you would if you were looking inside the a diamond and you were looking at the facets. So in the facets of the diamond, there's many aspects there. And one of them is very strong. And that strong one is a counterpart of me that's paralleling my work and doing it as a female, which I feel. And this kind of, you know, this, and this will actually, in some ways, dogleg over into what's going on right now with what I've termed the gender wars. Because I think a lot of people now are becoming acutely aware of aspects selves and others, and it's confusing. So, no, I'm not transsexual. No, I don't want to be a woman. I don't want to be a female, but I understand the female aspect of myself that is expressed by the being I call Aja, that has been with me since childhood. So in a sense, she is the intuitive, emotional side that informs my logical side. And we feed back onto each other in the same way. I become kind of her pipeline to understand things that are a little bit more <clears throat> logical, critical, um, linear. And oddly enough, at times, Audra becomes very strong and I become very much like her because my emotions will amplify. And at times, I think she pulls my logic, my ability to be, frankly, dispassionately cold in certain instances into that. And I think that's a humanizing aspect, <clears throat> pardon me, of the, of the aspects that we sense in our own personalities. It's not schizophrenic, it's not delusional. Um, we have expressions of ourselves, and they may not be female, they may be male, they may be some component of you that's not part of your current presentation, but it still is part of who you are, and you feed off of that, and if you intuitively sense it, and you begin to pull off of these dimensional aspect selves, you are greater than the sum of your own beingness, at least in that time when you're pulling that energy. You know, Jung, Jung ex talked about this a lot, and he called it, it's the anima for a man. You know, like the, the it's the um, yeah, reconciliation I, of in, irreconcilable opposites. Yeah. And the fact that you are actually able to experience it like that is, is huge. A lot of people don't get to that point, Randy. I hope you realize that where they, they, they have a, um, they're able to experience the other in such a way. It's part of the greater alchemical work, by the way. Yeah. So, I mean, I could just go on about this for hours. But I, I won't. But I just think this is fascinating. And um, this is actually what you would truly call the hermaph hermaphroditic ideal. Yes, which absolutely. is articulated in in a lot of the occult. Mm -hmm. It's twisted so much um, in its purest form. That's what it is. It's anima animus. I mean, yes. again, we're going back to Jung and Freud and what they were trying to art articulate in psychology. But Jung was tying it into the alchem the psychological it's alchemical process. Alchemical. It's yeah. very much an alchemical process. Yeah. You but see, we're afraid of it because we're afraid of it now because once again, the culture has taken something that's significant spiritually mm -hmm. and quite beautiful in process and turned it into something garish and ugly. Yeah, it's, they've made it grotesque. They've made, they it, have, it, they've made it inorganic. Well, we've taken the natural process and, and understand this. And from my perspective, and Emily and I have taught, we're going to do shows about this, and it's going to get it's going to get kind of controversial. So, Ooh, love that. The, the, the whole <laughs> thing about this is we have this whole thing now. This the the, the transgender movement, which isn't new. Um, Gosh, when I was a having kid, having it I, shoved in our faces, new though. We're having it shoved in our faces by the media, and by handlers inside of these networks. Mm -hmm. It's been and weaponized. We're having, we're having small children now being programmed. 
which terrifies me. And, yeah, I, and I agree. allowed to change gender at like six, seven years old. That's re ridiculous. Well, I think that the, the the so the real this this real aspect of it <clears throat> it really does exist. It somehow has become weaponized in a way, and um, now where it's like this, you know, is a, a very small population, and now it is it's 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 turned into like the it thing, right? And it's also it's also part of a loaded. It's a it's a loaded gun in loaded identity, yeah, yeah, in identity politics. Because when when they weaponized this, just like we talked about what happened in 1947, this signifies that there's a shift coming, and it signifies that a there's a natural shift in process that's now going to be bastardized and thwarted by something artificial, because that's the AI construct that works through this. So. As children, we have, we're very amorphous about ourselves. I mean, we express in gender identities for the most part within that spectrum. Mm -hmm. There are a world of different ways that human beings express themselves as beings within the context of gender and sexuality. And I say all of that without judgment. I say it with great love for the people that experience it. Yes, there are people that have gender dysphoria. Yes, there are people who feel they are trapped in the wrong body. My point is this. Small children have a very... Mm, they're comfortable with themselves up to the point where they have to go into social situations, which again are programmed. And now the, the social construct wants to reprogram, but it wants to program according to its agenda. And its agenda is not human, it's anti-human. And so we're given people like Bruce Jenner as ideals who are using the pharma, pharmaceutical medical system to transition. And if you read the case histories, I, I've actually been in six months of doing gender studies. Um, many, and I will say probably the most honest people out there in the transgender movement are not doing the chemical surgical thing. They've simply found ways to live within their own skin, even with the dysphoria. And the reason why this matters now goes back to what I was talking about, understanding aspect selves and the expressions of ourselves, they've convoluted everything. And we're confused. And a lot of people are confused because they don't understand the difference between the expression of an aspect self, which is part of us that is expressing in parallel, and how to process the emotions the consciousness, and even the physiology of all of that. I mean, I'm very aware that I express, in some ways, somewhat feminine. Not female, not... But I know my feminine aspects. I know how to express them. And I don't think most ma males are comfortable with that. I don't think a lot of women are comfortable with it either, because we've been role cast. So yes. as we are evolving here... It's important for the culture that we step back and re-examine these tight roles because, first off, you have this thing called toxic masculinity, and there's a truth to this. Men have been programmed into roles that are highly unnatural and roles that are killing us in mass because we were denied the emotional sides of ourselves and we're programmed to just basically be warriors and worker bees and superficial consumers of things and builders, but we're not really designed to process a refined emotional state. The best of our females are capable of this, understand it, but they've been programmed too into subservience. 
So you have dominance and subservience, largely the male construct dominant, the female construct subservient. And we have splintered the consciousness of humanity through sexuality, gender, and expression of roles in a very hyper way that has, we're, we're splintered consciousness. We're splintered consciousness on every level, and this is part of it, is all these roles. The harmonizing of this would be that we come to a place where we begin to recognize men can be softer, men can be more emotional, men can be free to love, they, they can be free to even embrace each other. I mean, the level of homophobia that exists in the culture is just excruciating. I mean, men are afraid to express emotions and physicality towards each other because of, of this fear on one level. And we're afraid to express the female aspects of ourselves in a way that would be constructive for us biologically and emotionally. So the culture war now is to splinter us, to get us to the point where we surrender our humanity <clears throat> into an AI construct, which promises us cyber sex, um, the ability to engage in the things that we would do in the astral realms naturally, in dream state, world building, flying, being able to navigate dimensional portals and things like that. I mean, these are all aspects of video game culture that a lot of people understand. And as they hype this up with VR, augmented reality, and things like that, they want us to substitute our biological selves for machines. And one of the ways that you do that is you begin to augment the human being surgically, medically, eventually digitally, mechanically, until you wipe out the human biology and what you have left are maybe super sentient robots. That need, that, they need power sorry, Jay, and upgrades on. and they need to be yeah, managed. software upgrades. They need to be I'm sorry. They need to be centralized. <laughs> that's the big thing, is that now yeah. that's giving up ownership of your body. Yeah. The bigger thing that I've been thinking about is this is a long game, right? This whole homogenization of the sexes, if you will, or alchemic alchemy, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> Could it not be I can, and, and this is probably because I'm on Jason Liu Overload on all the podcasts right now, but, you know, the, the Anakian yeah. dudes, the angel dudes were saying, you know, they wanted to take over, get rid of man. What if it's some kind of plan by that group, whatever it is? Oh, I totally think that. To, I think Jason Liu does, too. And I talked to him. Um, we did a second hour interview for our patrons, yeah. and we kind of, kind of went there, and we got to the rim of it. Yeah, I, I, I think... There's yeah. an archonic, angelic, fallen angels aspect to this. Yeah, I mean, is it, is it a, their, their design to homogenize the race to a point where they could possibly incarnate into it, to these vessels? Sure. These, these alchemical vessels. Maybe that's the whole goal. Maybe that's the long game right there. They want their realm back. Yeah, this is actually the early roots of off-planet radio. I mean, like, there's a guy back in 2010. Hmm. I was interview interviewing Nigel Kerner, who then was the uh, gray aliens and the harvesting of the yeah, soul. Yeah, yeah. And Nigel developed that a little bit more beyond the gray alien thing to understand the AI technology and VR technology and augmentation of humans into um, the software and <clears throat> digital realm was where this probably was all going. And he went directly there to the concept that this was a, a fallen angel slash archontic ploy right. to be able to bring themselves into vessels they could inhabit mm -hmm. in a way they can't inhabit now. I think that's exactly what I think. And the other side of that coin is that we don't know that, these, that this thing, these angels or whatever, aren't AI themselves. Exactly what I think they are. I think that's the whole point. Um, right, but I mean, that implies that we are AI then, if, if, it is a, if it's internal. It implies that we potentially could be AI. The reason I don't think we are AI is because of what we're talking about. It's like the old um, 
do android sheep have dreams what was it that androids the, dream of electric sheep uh, exactly mm -hmm. yeah so the question itself kind of goes okay so we're we're humans we have dream states we have emotions um we have a depth to us that cannot be contained within the most sophisticated algorithm just because the variables themselves are infinite. Mm -hmm. If you look at the spectrum of human beings, and I've thought about this a lot, and I've thought about it even from the standpoint of programming and how you program, and I understand that there's very high level expressions of computer language that are able themselves to anticipate and move that's the whole point of ai but within the spectrum of the human being we can't even sometimes understand our own emotional states we have dreams that are cryptic we have thoughts that seemingly are random and we act impulsively all of the things that are messy about human beings are the exact things that make them human and makes it as far as I'm concerned, impossible to write reliable algorithms to ever replicate. It may be possible within an environment, within a, an AI environment, but in the wild, human beings are incredibly unpredictable, unstable, emotionally volatile, messy, messy beyond belief. I mean, you know, we're talking everything from wet dreams and porno movies to snuff films. I, on the high end of the expression. Anything you can imagine has been imagined and expressed and enacted by humans in ways we couldn't imagine them. And that's why I don't think when I say we, well, that's under advisement too, because the question is, who's we? <laughs> what constitutes the population <laughs> of the world? Right, exactly. And how many of that is actually sentient, organic source beings? That's another question. Million, maybe. That's but another question I have for you, though. Forty-four thousand. <laughs> what? It's right. Way, where? <laughs> where do you weigh in on that whole thing, Randy? With, um, I mean, whatever you're gonna call them—the soulless NPCs, the uh, filler, all yeah. that. The sense. The sense. No, no, I've had the sense forever, and I've met some of them. I've met beings that I knew were not human. I knew it. I sensed it. I felt it. I saw through them. No, we encounter, we encounter people. I've sat as an exercise in shopping malls and just read auras. Something that I do mostly casually, but sometimes I'll do it with, with intent. <clears throat> read auras and been surprised at how many beings paraded in front of me that had absolutely no pulse at all. There was nothing that indicated a soul being there, a soul, spirit. And I've encountered beings where I've watched them flip, where I've seen them behave robotically, where I've seen them do things that you just go, hmm, nobody does that. I mean, I'm a student of human humanity. It's not, it's not perfect. But <clears throat> my sense on that is, that being the dreamers that are dreaming the dream, or it, put another way, a Hollywood production, and you go look at the, the set of a Hollywood production, if they're doing street scenes or something like that, they have walk-ons, not walk-ins, walk-ons. Right. So <clears throat> the Matrix is conveniently populated for us, a lot of walk-ons, beings and entities that are simply there to pass around in the background to mask the fact that no, there are not 7 billion living souls on this planet. And we need to maintain the illusion of this, especially in large populous areas. I go to New York and sometimes, or even in LA, and you walk around. <clears throat> Watch the people and ask yourself how many of them are genuinely, authentically real, and how many are animatronic synths. 
and just play with that. It's a mental game. But my sense is that the majority of what we are told occupies this world of supposedly seven burgeoning on eight billion. In all likelihood, is much, much smaller than that. Because I think the core of soul beings on this world is and always has been rather small. And I think we do not reproduce in the way that people have said. If you just, you know, here's the thing. I got this thought and then I looked at it and I went, there's a population in the 1960s. When you look at the numbers and the numbers <clears throat> from 3 billion to 7 billion in a 50 year expanse, what's the replication rate? And if you did probability at any time in your schooling, you kind of understand the classic track for that was the replication of rabbits, which are prolific. Humans aren't that prolific. But the numbers that I see on population indicate to me these numbers are skewed because we haven't been replicating at this rate in the last half century. I mean, by every statistic, we're told we're below replacement level in the West on birth rates. China institutes one child per family policy. People weren't breeding a lot in Russia because it's a miserable, it was a miserable place to live. We exterminated millions off the continent of Africa. So where the hell did all these people come from? That's a question you have to think about as a thought exercise when you're going, we went from a little over 2 billion in the 1950s, I think, to be wrong about the numbers. But in my head, I'll say- I have them right here. In the 50s, uh, 2.556 okay. billion in 1950. 1960, it jumped up 18.9% to 3 billion, then 3.7, 4.4. What I do see is a trend down over the 10 year growth rate from 22, 20, 18, 15, 12, 10, et cetera. As the population grows, that rate's going to drop, obviously. I mean, we're not, seeing a, we're not seeing an exponential increase in lifespan. I mean, lifespans have largely been static. I mean, they, they've ticked up a little bit. People used to die in their 30s and then. 60s became the average norm. The average male would live to be 65 years old. I think it's up to 72 now. But those numbers don't offset these exceedingly huge increases that statistically aren't possible if you believe all the other numbers that you've been told. <laughs> you just I mean, triggered just... me on the lifespan thing. What if, so like in the 50s and 60s, when people actually thought that there was just going to be this great space future, and they're going to have flying cars and all this great shit. You know, the, the stuff yeah. we were going to have, right? Yeah. You know, that may have given them to the will to live longer. They may have ex expected to live <laughs> to that age. What if it's an expectation? Now, today, people, I'm only saying this because I, I've noticed this year that the death rate has, like, tripled around yes. the world. Yeah. And A lot of death. That's pretty interesting. And... What if just people just say, oh, the future's never going to get here. This, I'm out of here. They just give up, and they have less expectation for their own future to pull them forward. The future is never going to get here. No, I know that. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying, what if that... But that's, that's actually an exquisite thought to just hold for a second. I mean, the future you were programmed to think that you were going to have in the world that was designed by the technocrats that were controlling the world that you lived in. Techno mages. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we were given all these visions that go back to the 40s and the 50s of this prosperous world, which never took into account the devastation that we've wrought on the earth, mm -hmm. or that we would have technological advances in one realm, like computers. I mean, if automobiles, progressed at the rate that, that the platform for PCs did in the first 20 years of the tech revolution, we'd be driving flying cars right now. Right, but, but even the PC uh, tech has not changed in 20, 25 years. No, no, it hasn't. The it's architecture gotten faster is faster and smaller. Big deal. And that architecture is actually much older. It's 50 years older. I've heard even But what about 20s. if you <laughs> counterbalance so. this with the stories we hear about extreme long lives? And, you know, I know there's the whole, um, 
non-human aspect to that. But, you know, you hear about, it's in old texts. It's in, in mm. some of the old tomes, that thousands of years, you know, hundreds of years at least for a lifespan in the Bible. So is it the math was just different? No, I think they lived in a different world. I think the world that you see described in the Old Testament Bible, especially in the book of Genesis, that isn't this world. I mean, that, that story, mm, this is interesting. There's a series of books. Is it Mars? No, it's not Mars. Okay. Let me show this to you. Oh. Good one, Jared. Well, I'm just wondering. I'm thinking, you know, I said, pull these books down without collapsing my bookshelf. I get the concept of so, like, the, the original timeline and all these that. These books here. No, uh, people can't see this because it's audio. Okay, so go out and look for um, the Ark of the Ark of Millions of Years. It's three vol volume set by E. I. Clark and um, Alexander Agnew. I got it. And that book postulates that the Ark basically is a spaceship, and that the spaceship migrated the contents of the what you would call the antediluvian world, which was another world into this world. So effectively, the world of Genesis, the world that supposedly the fall, was another world or another dimension of this world. Maybe so we're what they're describing there is thousands of years. First off, we don't have a baseline for any of that. Right. And biologically, I don't think we're talking about the same types of beings. Yeah, right. I, I do. I pull up to that. How do you see the dimensions? There's a lot of this talk about the fourth and fifth dimension that we're already in them, and but we exist side by side and interact with the third dimension. What are your thoughts on all that stuff? Well, putting numbers on it. Now we're back into finite again. Now we're in the linear again. I agree. It's just I'm noticing that some chatter happening, and it's it's actually kind of interesting. I've been enjoying hearing some people. Yeah, we get to learn which part of the Black Knight satellite is connecting to these people, programming them. <laughs> exactly, Jared. <laughs> because I mean, I've I've actually did I tell you this? I came up with a name for the galactically the Galactic Federation people. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I call I call them the the GFEs. The Galactic Federation Entrained. Oh, good. Entrained. Oh, well, I mean, aren't we told that time's the fourth dimension? Uh, yeah, I mean... So what's the fifth dimension? How do you express the fifth dimension if the fourth dimension is time? It's multiple boxes of time. Well, it's a, it's a time domain is the way I look at it. Sure. Because it's not absolute anyway. It's, it's basically the oscillator inside of a you know, computer. If, 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 if it's, I mean, if it's even that, if this, let's it's, say this yeah. is a real planet and we're spinning it around and all that nonsense, but if that's true and there is, there is no fifth dimension, you know, what if it's just a concept? What if it describes some inner layer of consciousness? I th that's the way I think of it, actually. Well, I tend to view it as a continuum. Mm. It, there, are de, there, is a demar, there are demarcations within it. This is, it goes back to Nox Mente, to dream state. It goes back to the mind of the night, which moves in and out of what we would consider to be boundaries seamlessly because it dissolves them, because they're artifices that we create. We create them mathematically and scientifically. We create them with things like time and calendars and clocks. We impose upon ourselves certain limits that constrain our lives in useful ways, by the way. I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying, <clears throat> if you experience timelessness in a dream state or a meditative state or an ordered state within theogens, whatever, you kind of understand that it's really pretty elastic. And the dimensions are like that, that you can move in and, in and out of dimensions and constructs that if you try to, if you try to sum them in a linear way, they don't make sense. It just becomes like a funhouse mirror nightmare. Because that's, that's actually what we live in. Well, much. yeah, I mean, that actually does have 
some stickability to it. When you're um, in the most lucid aspect of dreaming, because I think it's all just states of lucidity. So we can call that awake in the dream, out of body, however you want to look at it. When you're the most lucid while you while you're dreaming and you know you're dreaming. I know I'm dreaming, I'm lucid, I'm awake like this. What's the difference between that and this for you in those experiences? One is that that's rather limitless. And that feels a lot of times to me more authentic. I catch myself, and especially increasingly as I get older, feeling somewhat robotic about my existence. Whereas when I enter into dream state where, and especially if it's lucid, like if I grab a piece of it, and if I can bring a piece of it back, it's like, you know, souvenirs from uh, another world. Um, that feels more real to me for a while than this does. It's like we were talking earlier about those dreams that haunt you, that stay with you, because they connected on an emotional scale that we don't normally express. There are, there are emotions that we have that we can't express in normal terms. There are colors we have not seen. There are notes and sounds that we don't hear in this world. And yet we know they exist because we experience them there. That's an expanded reality, which tells me that that is the greater reality and then what we have here is a constrained reality. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, or at least, yeah, I mean, yes. I'm just going to say yes, because I can go off. And I did go off on this on your show, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go off on it enough. Look, you know, I think sitting and talking as we are, is a conversation really worth having and exploring. If you don't buy all the concepts, and I don't expect anybody to buy my concepts, as thought experiments, they expand us. You know, it's kind of like a soft form of LSD for two hours. You can sit back and listen to, you know, some random talk show host spin out on what he thinks the construct is. Yes. And we do this a lot. And the reason we're doing it isn't just to talk about it. We're vibrationally influencing on a cellular level this reality by having these kinds of conversations and putting this type of information out there. I know it. Yeah, we're seeing it in the cloud. It. Yeah, I've seen it. I know. Do you have, um, okay, so let's just talk about some of the scary stuff for a minute. <laughs> um, and so, you know, let's dive into some fear porn. <laughs> and, yeah. So, yeah. and so in, in context to Nox Minte, so like, um, the lower astral stuff, the whatever you want to call yeah, them, the yeah. demons, all that stuff. What, how do you experience all that erpy stuff? Crap. Yeah, that stuff's real. And the thing about oh, it is, this goes into frequencies and states of mind. Um, it's very important that we clean the house cellularly, whatever, however you view that. Uh, there are a lot of people who walk around bottled up with anger and fear and paranoia and suppression. And the real work that we're supposed to do, and this even goes into this year, opening it to show about your friend who passed on. We came here to do work. We came here to create. We also came here to deal with the archetypal dark side, the shadow work. And each one of us have it. A lot of it is vestigial from other lifetimes, other aspects of ourselves where we vibrationally are influenced. And a lot of it is just the shit we've gone through in this life. Everybody's got some, you know? I'm dealing with the fact that I was sexually molested when I was eight years old. And I'm dealing with it late in life because it was suppressed and because I didn't want to deal with it. And that's, that's shadow work because who in the fuck wants to deal with that? 
But the truth of the matter is that the harder it gets pushed down, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. It's, that's just my personal one. When you push the stuff down for long enough and suppress it, it becomes toxic. It and if whatever. it's toxic long, long enough, it becomes sepsis. And eventually it poisons the body and it poisons the soul. So part of our work is to deal with our own dark side, with our own shit. And part of it is to create and to expand the possibilities of this realm to become builders in the other realms. So the dark side is useful. The fear, the paranoia properly channeled. Um, we love this. That's why we like horror films. It's like it's why we'll sit and cringe our way through certain forms of entertainment, even just, you know, even the sports. I mean, look at it. You go out on a football field and you get your bones crushed. Well, there's people that enjoy that. There's people that enjoy blood sport. That's the dark side of humanity. So we're working through this on an individual level at the same time that we're working through it on a collective, bearing in mind that there are energies that have been in play for 75 years or more that cosmically are influencing us as a race towards, I will say, a culmination. It may not be like end of the world type stuff. It may just be the race that matriculates on some level. And so paranoia, fear, I mean, on one level, I love that stuff. I love it because it's, it stimulates us. I mean, used properly, it's a stimulus, but you can't live there. And you can't let it influence your decisions and your conscious waking state. Most people live in a state of fear, heightened, heightened states of fear. And look at the road rage, look at the paranoia on the street, look at drug addiction alcoholism, sexual abuse, those are all manifestations of paranoia and fear by somebody inflicted on another human being. And so that's what that all is to me. I love it. When you, so Randy, when you encounter, um, so at this point, when you encounter these, uh, for lack of a better word, um, shadowy, even projections or um, entities, mm. and especially in, in, say, in context to dreaming, how do you deal with them currently, not in the past? Those shadow beings can actually come pretty closely into your physical dimensional zone as well. Oh, I so agree. Uh, um, I had an encounter out in Arizona about five years ago where I had one literally follow me back here. And I had to deal with it here. And the way I deal with it is really in ritual. Um, everything from what I consider to be sacred prayer, meditation, energy, to expressing my divine will for that being to vacate. And in some cases, it's not much different than dealing with demons because that's effectively what they are, the shadow entities. You're dealing with demons. Yeah, I and agree. That requires spiritual warfare. That means you have to exert energy. That means you have to expel them in some cases. And you have to let them know that you are sovereign. And I don't mean that in that trite, bullshit kind of way that people trot sovereign out. You assert your sovereignty on an energetic level. When you stand up to something and you do not allow it to dominate you in any way, physically, mentally, spiritually, or in any other way, you have to stare that mother down. And I've had, I've had encounters with demons. I've had encounters with shadow beings. You know, there's, they showed up here for quite a long time, and one of them showed up with uh, my youngest son, and he saw them. And we had to deal with that. We, we did everything. We did sage, we did sacred prayer, we did chant. Um, I sat up a few nights, I fasted, I've meditated, whatever it takes to expel them. 
I mean, they're, they're, they're real. I, I, people say they don't believe in that, but those are the, those shadows, those dark entities are the things that animate the darkest aspects of humans. It's what drives them. Yeah, I think when, when I encounter people kind of dispelling it by not believing it or, or making fun of it, to me, this is a representation of oppression mm -hmm. and, um, and it only feeds into the energy. It actually feeds into it more than acknowledging it. Acknowledging it is set, it, it, the act of acknowledgement is the act of observa observing. And when you observe it, it is, you change the whole, you change everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is changed by seeing it in them. And then, you know, and then there's, you know, a lot more can be said, but the, the repressive aspect that we see collectively is giving this type of energetic um, realm a lot to work with. And I'm, I'm noticing it amping up around us. So not mm -hmm. it, all our personal demons, all our personal shadows are kind of like joining forces mm -hmm. in a way. Are you noticing this? Yeah. They're becoming stronger because... Coalescing. Mm -hmm. Well, in collusion, like ours, it's it's you know their strength is in unity. The principles articulated even like in the New Testament, the word the words of the human the the being that walked the earth they called Jesus said that whatever two or more of you agree upon shall be so. That right there was the power of consent and agreement, and so. Even on an individual basis, when we agree with powers of darkness, we have conspired with them, despite the fact it's not in our best interest. That's how fear works. Fear gets you to agree that something has power over you. I mean, people say, well, that's an irrational fear. All fear is effectively irrational. Fear, in its simplest form, is simply what happens with our limbic system and fight and flight and all the biochemical things that go into preserving our biology. Things that if you discipline yourself, people who study martial arts understand this pretty well because they learn how to, they learn how to control breath and metabolism. Those are fundamentals to not being in a state of fear, of being able to control your nervous system. So our biology on that level and then our consciousness and our spiritual will are the things that either thwart the darkness or conspire with them against us. So in a sense, we manifest all of this and we conspire with it. That doesn't mean it's not external. It means that what you, when you brought this into your reality, either consciously or subconsciously, you conspired with it to have power. So then you've got to find the source of its power, and you've got to find where you've agreed with it, and you've got to break the power of consent. Yeah, the consent thing is a very big deal, and and it's, it, people, I, what I hear, I hear it so it's like a meme in a way, and and yet I'm not noticing when you take it in to yourself and you actually mean i i give you no consent or i do not consent i you know when it comes from self your deeper level of self your idea of self that's one thing but there's a lot of empty like maybe it's these npcs or whatever we want to call them that push these very hollow ideas around and turn something that is powerful like i do not consent into a fucking meme <laughs> you know pardon my french i had that crazy well, they've made it, what they've done is they've made it trite because right they, they, what they're not telling people is this is this actually goes into fundamentals of law as well first off if you just treat this as a law issue you have to figure out what your venue is. You have to figure out what jurisdiction is. You have to understand your standing. You have to understand how the law is being applied. 
because there's cosmic laws, there's laws that operate on every level. I mean, our legal system, God help us, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's pitiful. It's based on a higher cosmic law system that has to regulate the equilibrium of universe. So we have to understand the functionality of law, and we have to understand how we have come under its jurisdiction. What is our venue? What is our relief? I mean, all of those things are true in a court of law, and they're also true in the court of the spirit where you're dealing with dark entities. How in the hell did you get here? Oh, that's that night when I went out and <laughs> drank a fifth and um, did some very dishonorable things with a certain woman of disrepute, or I was violent, or something is a gateway. Something I learned this from people who don't know my background. Um, I was an ordained minister at one time. I learned spiritual warfare in a classic way in a Christian church. And I can tell you that when you stripped it all away in the ritual and stuff, there were truths there. There's truths inside all of these great old books that tell us how to deal with these things. And when you begin to understand spiritual warfare, you have to understand, again, law, jurisdiction, authority, and how you can attain authority and righteousness to be able to prevail in any situation. And a lot of it is just cleaning your vessel, dealing with your shit, and not trying to bullshit your way through the current realm of reality. We've just got to stop kidding ourselves. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's major. It's major. I, 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 this is part of the reason why I step away so much, too, is I see important stuff being twist there's so much that's happening that's getting in the realm of like twisting and inversion yeah. that is taking away from the potency and and then and in that it is desensitizing people and 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 then when you become desensitized you become unempowered impotent impotent thing it's the, <laughs> that's metaphor, a, the best it's word the metaphor of porn yes. basically it's fear porn for a reason because it overstimulates you to the point where your neurological system doesn't function on a normal level. But we have 20-year-old guys out there. Like I, I'm on forums and stuff. There's 20-year-old guys out there. They have erectile dysfunction because of the porn and the delivery system of porn, which is rapidly conveying all these images constantly into their nervous system. 20-year-old guys, man. That's insane. But it's a metaphor 50 for 50-year-old guys, too, I should throw in there. Well, of course they do. And I mean, there's... Look, Everybody can have a bad night. So my, but my point is this. That's a metaphor for what's going on in the information communities. Because they've had so much fear porn shoved at them for so long that they're overstimulated. They don't know when to step back, process information, get rid of the... There's always crap that comes with all of this. Mm -hmm. And get rid of that and then figure out what in that information is important, keep it, maintain it, nurture it, and then build on it. But most people, and I know people like this and I love them, but they're junkies and they want the next fix. And it's, mm -hmm. it's got to be harder than the last fix, which means, you know, after you've burned through info wars, where do you go next? What's the next level to this? What can I find that really <laughs> jacks my limbic system? And unfortunately, that's not a considered way to take information in. That's the model of modern media, just to oversaturate everything. It's how advertising works. It is. And, and for me, it seems, especially through the trajectory of my, my life coming from, you know, the early 70s and thinking about you know, I mean, I remember when we had an Atari. I remember when we got a color TV. Yeah, yeah. So um, how how it's just dramatically changed. And it, it truly mm -hmm. does feel to me at this point, without even question, that this has all been weaponized against us with long legs looking at generational change. 
yep. via our so tech. Noises, yeah. Oh, no problem. Via the tech. Yeah. Tech's all weaponized. I mean, look, you can use technology for good. I'd like to think we're doing that with what we do. But tech is toxic because most of us don't know how to use it properly. Well, that's why it's toxic is so it's it's a fabulous tool and it's especially fabulous because we're able to be anywhere and and yeah. be productive and do these kinds of things. Research, you can be an, an extreme introvert as I am and still reach out and have meaningful experiences yeah. with, with in the comfort of your own home. So, however, like we're just talking about with the porn it's it's releasing it's changing the neural pathways and people it's it's become addictive by design by flicker rate and 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 now as we move into like um fat this is porn too you we want it faster 5g you get it faster deeper downloads harder i mean it's also pornographic yeah, this and is where we go balls back deep downloads it. yep go ahead jerry no i, was, <clears throat> I felt like i stepped on no you stepped didn't on you. i stepped on the, you i'm sorry i was gonna the, the, the vr and the augmented reality that's what this is all building towards because as external reality sucks more and more you're just going to create a class of people and i'm already seeing it i've had people drag vr goggles in here and want to show me this on their Android phone. And I'm like, get that the fuck away from me. I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. There's a space where that tech doesn't enter in. And it starts within three to five inches of my eyes mm -hmm. and my head. I don't want it. That's where I've drawn my line where I go, okay, I'm done with this. I'm good. I'm not entertaining this anymore. I'm pretty severe when I encounter, when I hang out with people. I literally won't, your phone has to stay away. Unless there's some sort of emergency, I, you don't get my time then. So we don't go out to eat or we don't do this because yeah. I don't do it very often. And so people that are in my world understand this. No, I don't want you to check me in here. No, I don't want to have a conversation while you're texting. No, I don't need you to pull up your phone and show me something. I'm here to interact with you and this is how it is. I didn't used to be that way. I've gotten that way. So no. I'm always the only person at, say, a table, you know, in a restaurant and with pe the people around me that are actually interacting with each other. It's rare. See, once we cut off conversations with each other, once we interact with machines on a level that we used to reserve for human beings, that's a sign that we're slipping into AI. Or it's AI's clear construct see conquering human beings isn't a matter of taking them over completely it's luring them far enough to the edge where eventually they just fall in yeah but, i mean at that point you're hypnotized you're no longer going to make better decisions based on a human value system you're going to make it based this is the danger of ai you're going to make a decision based on a machine-based system mm -hmm. because it's alluring because there's a million colors and it's 4k pixels and um it's surround sound and uh, the colors are better the sensations are better <laughs> the porn's better um we'll just live in a pod but the hard-on's gone but the it's hard -on all better but there's Doesn't no hard-on you don't need it anymore <laughs> yeah. don't need it that's anymore. right prostate orgasm I mean, <laughs> the secret <laughs> the secret of sex is that it's all in the mind anyway right so <laughs> yeah yeah oh, totally yeah so bypass bypass the root chakra and you go kind of bypass bi biology altogether at that point mm -hmm. exactly have you well, seen we're doing movie? that with all the poisons right mm -hmm. and the nanobots mm -hmm. uh randy have you seen this movie or read the book ready player one saw the um Saw the trailers that came out for the film. I've not read the book yet. I know the basic plot on it, but I haven't seen it now. I think it it it, it makes a good argument for where we're headed. Mm -hmm. That I do too. I don't know about the living conditions, but yeah. specifically with VR and whatnot. Um, I ran the trailer in a Saturday morning Patreon chat with our group, 
as as an example of exactly that i said you need to look at this because this is seriously good filmmaking it's steven spielberg Mm -hmm. and this is yeah this is predictive programming this is where they want us to go Mm -hmm. your life will become so miserable so worthless so constrained that the only escape will be to become legal escape right Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I agree. I agree. It's it's just a, and also woven in the book into the movie. Rather, I didn't read the book, so woven into the movie is a lot of esoterica, uh, oh, yeah, especially on the the van that they travel around it. It's, there's there's like a, an elongated skull on one side. Isn't this the movie where they actually planted a lot of these? I guess you would call them visual Easter eggs in them regarding going like to Back to the Future and films like that. Yes. Basically, this is kind of a roll-up of all the futuristic predictive programming movies that have been done over the last 30 years. Yeah, it's like a That's um, the concept that I sort of got Spielberg was trying to weave into this. Yeah, but I, like, I can't see Spielberg doing that on purpose other than for art's sake and to preserve that because it's something he loves. Of course, and then, that's valid. I mean, that's basically the way I look at a lot of what Kubrick did as well. Of course. So, I mean, any programming that gets reinforced by the movie is our own program. Mm-hmm. So we're we're reinforcing it. We absorbed it. Yep. So, I mean, it just this just goes back to people who like the victimhood state where, oh, they're doing this to me. No, you're kind of doing it to yourself most of the time. It's they're they're instigating it. Not yeah. I'm this not is, saying there isn't shit going on that is direct, but I'm, you know, this kind of thing seems this very This is soft. where, again, this goes into dealing with your shit in the dark side. Um, we have to take responsibility even for our reactions to things, including our own cultural assimilation. We would just have to, there's things that I'm nostalgic or have been nostalgic for that are triggers for me. And I don't think, despite all the talk that's been done about mind control over the last, certainly the last decade, I still don't think most people understand they, they've been mind controlled and that they have triggers and that those triggers are constantly being utilized and not in their best interests because they keep wanting to pull you back into emotional states so that you can be manipulated. And a lot of that now, now, this is where desensitization is useful. I'm not really all that nostalgic. I rarely listen to the music I listened to when I was a kid, even though I like some of it. I constantly push the boundaries so that I'm not stuck in a frame of reference that can emotionally trigger me in certain ways. And I'm aware of my triggers. Even in dream state, I, I see them pop up. There's like little subliminals that'll show up and float by. And I think, you know, in a way, that's our minds warning us. Subconscious is going, you need to look out at this stuff. You need to be aware of this. There's triggers here. There's things that are traps. And so there are Easter eggs that pop up. So even from an art standpoint, even when Spielberg's doing art or Kubrick's doing art or whoever, they're still messengers on a cosmological scale going, mm, they're, they're bringing part of the, the plot to life. The exactly. Story. Yeah, 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 I get that. forming the plot with totally. something mean, meaningful. Yep. That's probably a great place, you know, to even kind of wrap a lot of this up is... Totally. totally. We have to be totally responsible for how we respond to the stimulus that's thrown at us. Whether Especially it's technology or dreams. Babies and cages, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, the, the dream what I'm sorry well, what was the last line there the dream especially in the dream state yeah even in the dream state in the dream. yeah right because yep. it's important actually it's someone take ownership of that stuff got a question for you okay this is from Darcy she wanted to know if you think that we are Jesus and have saved ourselves. <clears throat> the, 
but well, let me put it to you this way. What is it you needed to be saved from? And why do you require an external savior? And I think actually Jesus kind of answered that. See, this is where religion really screwed things up. It, it's actually the way we close the show. The truth is inside you. The kingdom of God is within you. And you don't really require an externalized savior. What you need to do is understand that once you unlock your own sense of purpose and the core of who you are and you're true to those values, which includes obviously all the good things, which in you know, love, honesty, integrity. There's no salvation required. We were never damned. There is no original sin. So are we Jesus? Yeah. On one level, each one of us, what, what else did, no, I'll just, since you went there, um, these things in greater you shall also do. So why do we need a savior? We don't. All right. Another question from Affluent for you. How can talking to alien spirits make life with each other in the material realm better? I don't think they do. I mean, okay, so alien spirits, that, that's... It's a loaded question. <laughs> it's, well, I get where that's coming from in the context of where we've gone in this, in this conversation, so mm -hmm. I'll say this. Um, if you're referring to what I talked about earlier about my childhood experiences, I view them as expressions of my higher self, as manifestations of other beings who appeared to me to teach me in much the same way that teachers will appear to people. The voice and the imagery that's behind that was probably programmed for me because it took my attention and allowed me to receive information from it. I don't think they're aliens. And I've always questioned anything that I've been presented with by an outside entity, regardless of who or what it is. That's a good policy. Especially blue people. <laughs> all right well, thank you randy for joining us it's been awesome oh, been awesome interview been awesome yeah and Great uh comments. you want to tell everyone i've got your links for your website and your youtube channel in the show notes in the description here so cool if you want to tell anyone else what else something they're on patreon you guys are on patreon yeah yeah so basically you really just go to offplanetradio.com offplanetmedia.net. Just go to offplanetradio.com. We have a Patreon group. There's links on the front page of the website for that. And um, the YouTube channel for the videos and the podcasts are there going back years. And other than that, look me up on Facebook. If, you, um, if, if you we dare. like each other, we'll be friends. <laughs> cool. Very cool, very cool. <laughs> Oh, and I'm gonna I'm come I'm on the show soon. It's already canned with Emily. Right. Yes. That's yes. coming up. Right. Thank you, right. Randy. This yes, was thanks. a great, thanks. great thanks. pleasure. Thank you for being candid. Mm -hmm. I yeah, expect that appreciate, from you. Appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you everyone else for joining us. And be sure to join in next week when we have Melissa Martel from uh the ESP order type. She's cool. Ghost lady. She's very cool. You'll like it. So have a great night, and we will see you next time. Bye.